السلام عليكم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه وبعد uh, My name is uh, Imam Mustafa Khattab I used to be the Imam of Rashid uh, Masjid uh, 2011 and 2012 So Mustafa Khattab And I also go by the Somali name uh, Mustafa Abdi Farah Inshallah So uh, I'm here to talk to you for the next half hour Inshallah about the month of Ramadan And how you can take the benefit of this month and maximize your hasanat. And let me begin with a story. I always like stories. You know, um, stories to a speech is like spices on chicken suqar and beef suqar and biryani. It gives it ruh, right? So this is a true story that happened in Egypt many years ago. There was a famous writer. His name was uh, Dr. Ibrahim al-Fiqi. Very famous in the Arab world, rahimahullah. So he said, one summer, he was in Cairo, he decided to take his family for vacation. al Ghardaqa or Sharm al-Sheikh, in a coastal city. That was like seven, eight hours drive away. So they decided to travel at night, because during the day, if you have been to uh, Cairo, it's very, uh, very hot during the day, dusty, the roads are crowded, so it is better to travel at night. So they made sure they, uh, they got everything, they put their bags in the car, they took food, they took chicken suqar, beef suqar, moos, baris, all the, all the good stuff uh, with them. And they made sure they didn't leave any of the kids behind. Uh, if you have seen Home Alone, the young uh, guys, mashallah, you, you know the story of Kevin, they left Kevin in the house. Yeah, so they made sure they got everything. However, he made one mistake, one big mistake. And the mistake was, he forgot to fill up his tank. He had some gas in the car. He thought, you know, on the way, inshallah, I'm going to fill up the tank, but he forgot. The kids are fighting in the back. I want to take the tablet. No, I want the phone. I want to go to the washroom. Mushkila kabira. You say, mushkila win, right? Big problem. So he forgot to fill up the tank. So he took the highway. It was his first, first time taking that highway. And he said, maybe in 10, 15 minutes, inshallah, I'm going to find uh, uh, you know, a gas station. I will fill up my tank. He drove half hour, no gas station. Another half hour, no gas station. And after an hour and 15 minutes, the gas light on the dashboard started to flash. When he saw that, he panicked and he freaked out. We're doomed because it's very dark. It's after midnight, no gas stations. I don't see any lights, no forms of light, of life, nothing. You don't see anyone on the highway. And he was scared to death because I have my family with me. And, and subhanAllah, you, uh, the young guy is here. Wallahi, nobody loves you in this dunya more than your parents. And this man in the story, he was not worried about himself, he was worried about his children. Imagine if we run out of gas, we have to sleep on the side of the road, it's very dark, scary, you can hear the wolves howling in the background. It's a very scary thought. Then eventually, subhanAllah, before they ran out of gas, he saw some light from the distance, and he drove there, it was a small rest area. And he asked the guy, do you have some gas? And the guy said, no, we don't have gas. Big problem again. However, the, the guy said, if you drive 10 minutes down the highway, there is a small rest area, they will have gas for you. Khalas, mushkila majrito, alhamdulillah, no problem, we're gonna drive. When he got in the car and he started to drive like 200 meters, he, he waited and he said, oh, but what if I go there and they sold out? They're sold out, no more gas. Or even worse, I don't know about Somalia or Pakistan, in Egypt we are very flexible with time. If I say that I'm going to visit you, I'm on the way, I'll be with you in 10 minutes, it means in Egypt, two to three business days. <laughs> yeah. Like if a guy tells you in Egypt, I'm going to come to your house after Salatul Asr, it means I'm going to come to you before Yawm Al Qiyamah, Judgment Day, right? Very flexible with time. But subhanAllah, he drove 10 minutes and sure enough, he found the rest area and he asked the guy, do you guys have gas? And he's, the guy said, yes, we have gas. So the brother said, Wallahi, I went into Sajda and I hugged the guy and that was the sweetest yes I received in my life. Then he said, oh, no, 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 the second best, because when my wife said yes, when I proposed, that was the best one. He wanted to be politically correct. He didn't want to sleep in the driveway. 
So he filled up his tank and he continued his way to the resort where they were going to have the vacation. But he said, he wrote about this and he said, throughout my journey to my destination, I was thinking about the month of Ramadan. Because Ramadan for us Muslims is like this gas station for me when I was traveling. So Ramadan is your only gas station for your Iman on the highway to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Jannah. So he said, imagine after reaching this only gas station that I found, if I said, no, 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 I'm going to skip this one, I'm going to look for the next one. We make the same mistake. So many of us say, I'm going to take it easy this Ramadan. Inshallah, next Ramadan, I'm going to do my best. Like, dude, who told you that you're going to see another Ramadan? Maybe this is your last one. Uh, we say in Somali, Nulushu Artahai. Life is very short, right? Life is very short, really. Life is very short. Even if you live to be a hundred years old, it's still a very short life. Wallah, it's a short life. Nuh alayhi salam, some of the ulama say, yes, he invited people to Islam for 950 years, mentioned in Surah Ankabut, but he died when he was 1,750 years old. This is what some of the ulama say. Uh, there is a hadith, Abu Ya'la, uh, and Ibn Abi Dunya, uh, Nuh alayhi, Rasulullah sallam was asked, you know, about the life of Nuh alayhi salam. He said, Nuh alayhi salam was asked, how do you see your long life? And he said, my life was very short. It felt like I entered my house from the front door. I stood a little bit in the living room, then I left from the back door. This is in a hadith in Ibn Abi Dunya. Life is very short. And imagine, let's say, if someone dies at the age of 60, how did they spend their life? Well, first of all, if you sleep seven to eight hours a day, it means one third of your life is gone. You sleep 20 years, if someone dies at the age of 60, may Allah give you a long and healthy life. But if someone dies at the age of 60, they sleep 20 years. 20 years are gone. Bye bye. Then the first seven, eight years of your life, you're not doing anything. You're just teething and crying and falling off the stairs, missing with electricity, you know. Then you go to school, homework, assignments, papers, another seven years gone. If you eat three meals a day, I know some people eat like seven, but let's say three, then technically you eat about three, four years of your life, you are eating nonstop. Washroom, one year. Uh, if you get stuck on the highway here, mashallah, coming back at, at five o'clock from work, 15 years of your life are gone. Sah? Uh, social media, ho uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, uh, video games, Candy Crush, Fortnite, another 20 years of your life gone. What is left in the end really is the five minutes that you spend in Salah and this is what will give you Jannah in the end. Uh, life is really very short. If you think about it this way, life is very short. So make sure that you spend a quality time with Allah. When you pray, think that this is my last Salah. When you witness the month of Ramadan, this is my last Ramadan. Treat it this way because it will give you a sense of urgency and it is going to be a quality Ramadan. It's going to be a quality Salah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I remember I started working as an Imam in the U.S. in Clemson, South Carolina in, two, in 2007. 2007. First night, Taraweeh. We're testing the mic. One, two, three, Allah, Allah. We're testing on the mic for Salatul Isha. Getting ready for the first taraweeh. One of the brothers came to me and he was running and he was scared. Imam, Imam, I have a question for you. Okay, well, what is your problem? And the question was, this is the first night of taraweeh, dude. First night. Salatul Isha, then taraweeh. His question was, when is Eid? Like, really, when is Eid? I said, subhanAllah, we haven't even started Ramadan. And the brother was not ready for the month. And this is the problem with many of us. We are ready for different acts of worship, but not for Ramadan. Yeah, now let me give you a few examples. Arkanul uh, Islam Khamsa, the five pillars of Islam are five. We know them. Sah, Kalima Shahada, Ashhadu, for someone to become Muslim. For someone to take Kalima Shahada and to take Shahada, become Muslim, they read about Islam, they ask questions, they visit the Imam. They take a shower, they book an appointment, they come, ashhadu, ashhadu, they become Muslim. Sah? They prepare for it. For salah, namaz, mashallah, you make wudu, 
You wait for the time for salah, you go to the masjid, you face the qibla, you pray with the imam. For zakah, you calculate nisab, it has to stay with me for a year. Am I going to pay the money here or send it to Mukadishu or Karachi? You know, hajj, you prepare for hajj like four or five years in advance. You save money. Are you going to travel with, with your mom or with your wife? Then the bookings, the flights, the tickets, the ihram. The... But for Ramadan, different. As soon as they announce that Ramadan is tomorrow, people panic and they freak out because they are not prepared. Then they only start to pack their fridge with, mashallah, chicken suqar and beef suqar and biryani, spicy like jahannam, you know. They prepare physically, but spiritually they are not ready. How do you prepare for the month of Ramadan? You have to have a strategy for the month of Ramadan. And in a couple of minutes, I'm going to tell you about the best strategy, the strategy of Rasulullah for this month. And this is why a lot of people miss out because they don't have a strategy. So I don't want to bore you. I'm going to tell you a couple of quick stories, inshallah. The first story is a true story that happened in Germany back in 2004. So there is an electronics company that has stores in different cities in Germany. It is called Saturn. Saturn in, in, uh, in Germany, the company is like Best Buy in Canada. They, they sell electronics. So what happened? They were going to open store number 150. They had 149 stores and now they're opening store 150. So from their, their Facebook fan page, they selected a lucky winner. They picked a guy to go for the grand opening, and this lucky winner, because it's store number 150, they said, we're going to give you 150 seconds. You go inside, you have two minutes and a half, uh, 150 seconds, to collect any electronic items you want, put them in the cart, you just take them home, you don't have to pay anything. That's fantastic. On the day of the grand opening, this guy, Sebastian, 27 years old, he came, three, two, one, go. 150 seconds, two minutes and a half, he came out, he collected items, electronic items, worth 45,000 American dollars in one minute, in two minutes and a half. They did an interview with him, it's available on uh, YouTube in German, I studied German for five years. Uh, so basically, he said in the interview, because they were surprised, they were stunned, how could you collect this number, like amount of money in a short time? And he said, I had a strategy. He said, number one, I visited all the Saturn stores in my city. They had like a couple of other locations. He visited them. And generally big stores like Walmart and others, they, they have the same layout. So he knew where they kept all the expensive items. And he put on comfortable clothes, running shoes. He got inside. He filled up the cart. He came out. And he came out like two or three seconds before the, uh, his, his time was up. He pulled the fridge out, 45,000 American dollars. If it was someone like me, no strategy, I will go inside, I will look for toilet paper, I will look for sweets, I will look for whatever, nuts. I come out, 15 bucks, you know? We do the same thing with the month of Ramadan. The Ramadan is full of gems, treasures. This is the best time of the year. Subhanallah, everything is multiplied in this month. Rasulullah said, if you pray Salatul Asr in Jama'ah, you get the reward of 70 salawat. You pray one sunnah, you get the reward of fard. You do one umrah in Ramadan, you get the reward of hajj. Subhanallah, everything is multiplied. And this is why people give their zakat sadaqah in the month of Ramadan. Because of this, everything is multiplied. And Rasulullah was generous all year long. But he was exceptionally generous in the month of Ramadan. Everything is multiplied. And this is my nasiha to you in this blessed month of Ramadan. One of the best sadaqat and zakat charity that you can give is to this masjid. Masjid al Farooq. It deserves your support because this is not a Muslim country. No awqaf, no bait al mal. I know in, in Muslim countries in Pakistan, Egypt, they say don't give zakat to the masjid because they have awqaf bait al mal. So the support comes from the Muslim government in Turkey, other places. But here, no support. The only support that comes is through your zakah and sadaqah with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in non-Muslim countries, you can give zakah and sadaqah to the masjid. It's not a Muslim country. So keep this in mind, inshallah. 
So everything is, is multiplied in this month and we have to take advantage of this. However, <clears throat> we have big distractions. Shaitan is, is, is very active in this month. Uh, they say in Urdu, Shaitan Bahot Akal Madhe. Shaitan is very smart. He plays games with you. So, have you heard the story of Imam Malik and the elephant? No? It's, it's a very popular story, but, uh, you know, it's not, it's not out there. Imam Malik, rahimahullah, one of the biggest scholars of Islam, like Imam Abu Hanifa, Shafi, and Imam Ahmed. Imam Malik didn't have an elephant. But this story has something to do with Imam Malik and the elephant. Uh, one day, Imam Malik, Imam Al-Zaman, he was teaching in the masjid in Medina. And subhanAllah, the masjid was packed. Thousands of people would come to the majlis of Imam Malik to learn from him. People came from Morocco, they came from Iraq, they came from Syria, from Egypt, all over the Muslim world. And while he was teaching his class, someone came from the back and he said, listen up everybody. Someone brought an elephant to Medina. They had a show in Medina, uh, they brought an elephant. So all the students of Imam Malik, thousands of them, they left to see the elephant because they never saw an elephant before. They didn't see an elephant before, right? Hatta subhanallah, uh, during the Khilafah of Umar radiallahu anhu, someone brought an elephant, like they captured an elephant in one of the battles with the Persians. They brought it to Medina. Some of the Sahaba, when they saw the elephant for the first time, because the, the biggest animal they saw so far was the camel. It was their first time ever to see an elephant, huge, with a big trunk and big ears. For some of them said, Amin khalqillahi ma nara. Was this created by Allah? Subhanallah, this is huge. Like, it's, it's unbelievable, incredible. So everyone left except for one student. His name was Imam Yahya. Imam Yahya. So Imam Malik said, why didn't you go to see the elephant? And he said, yeah, Imam, I left my country. I traveled thousands of miles. And I came here to see Imam Malik, not the elephant. So he prioritized. He knew what he was doing. So for some of us, your cell phone is an elephant. It distracts you. Video games, big elephant. Movies, big elephant. So we have to get rid of all these elephants in, in the month of Ramadan if you want to maximize your hasanat. Okay, so now, I got only like five minutes. Uh, what was the strategy of Rasulullah in this month? Number one, physical ibadah. Physical ibadah. Fasting, praying, i'tikaf. This is all physical. The second type is verbal. Dua. Quran, dhikrullah, istighfar, it doesn't cost you anything. The third one is financial ibadah, zakah and sadaqah. And we said everything is multiplied in this month. I know if we have some sisters here who are, are listening, uh, some of them, subhanAllah, they are des desperate to witness Laylatul Qadr. But if the monthly cycle happens, Subhanallah, they're very frustrated, they're crying, why me, why is this happening to me, you know, I'm losing all these hasanat, I'm doomed. You are not. Because as I said, there are three types of ibadah that we do in the month. If you miss the first type, the physical ibadah, if you're not able to fast or pray, you still have the other two. You can make dua, you can make istighfar, you can ask Allah for forgiveness, and so on and so forth. And you can give zakah, sadaqah. If you make up the days after Ramadan, Allah will give you the reward. Allah is kareem, you're not missing out anything. So you shouldn't be annoyed if this happens to you, inshallah. So physical ibadah, financial ibadah, and the verbal ibadah. So one of the best things that you can do in this month, in conclusion, inshallah, is to connect yourself with the Quran. The biggest ulama of all time, Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim, Ibn, Ibn Taymiyyah, Kibar Al-Ulama, they spend their times studying fiqh, hadith, seerah, uh, Quran, tafsir. And before they died, they had one regret. Many of them said, I wish I dedicated my whole life 100% to the Quran. SubhanAllah. The Quran is your book of life. It gives you ruh, as Allah says in the Quran. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Surah Yaseen, liyundira man kana hayyan. It, it's a reminder to those who are truly alive, right? SubhanAllah, back home, if you go to my country, Egypt, 
If you hear Quran in someone's house, the first question they ask, who died? Because the Quran is now is being associated with death. They play it if someone dies. Some people put it in the car because we don't have car insurance back home. It's not fard. You know, it's like, uh, it's like permissible. Mubah. So what they do, they put a copy of the Quran uh, in the car, on the dashboard, or in the back, you know, for protection against theft and against accidents. And so on and so forth, subhanAllah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran to be your guide. Some people just frame it in calligraphy and put it to make your living room look nice. But that's it. So your relationship with the Quran is to read it, to do tadabbur on it, to live your life according to it. If you can memorize the Quran, alhamdulillah. But memorizing the Quran is not the end of your relationship with the Quran. Your relationship with the Quran begins with hiv. This is the basic level. But you need to read it, understand it, apply it to your life, do tadabbur on it, and teach it to others if you can. And in conclusion, this is what I tried to do. I tried in the last 10 years, in the last 10 years of my life, I dedicated at least 10 hours every day of the last 10 years to translate the Quran and the project, the clear Quran. That's more than 35,000 hours in the last 10 years alone. So I did the clear Quran for non-Muslims, this uh, black gold uh, copy. It uses the word God because non-Muslims can relate. Uh, it doesn't have Arabic inside. Then we have the Arabic English edition for Muslims and it uses the word Allah. Then we have the clear Quran dictionary. One time I was in uh, Toronto, Mississauga, leading Taraweeh and this Pakistani brother came to me one night. I think it was close to the middle of Ramadan. And the Qari, we had a Qari from Egypt with a beautiful voice. He was reciting Surah Yusuf and Arab people were crying in Salah. And this Pakistani brother came and he was mad at me. So he came from the back, he was yelling at me, Imam Sahib, he was angry, you know, what's wrong with you? I said, what did I do, dude? What did I do? He said, every night I come here, I stand in namaz, one hour and a half, I don't understand anything. Okay. So I said, okay, let me think about it. And subhanAllah, for the next six years, I did the clear Quran dictionary. The Quran has only 2,000 root words. This is a very small number. 2,000 root words. Once you know those 2,000 root words, you'll understand everything in the Quran. You're not going to need the translation anymore. And at the end of the book, I made manvuma, a uh, couple rhymes, nine pages, and those nine pages at the end of the clear Quran dictionary have all the words of the Quran in Arabic, the 2,000 words in nine pages. If you memorize them, khalas, done. Then, alhamdulillah, we did the clear Quran for kids. It's tafsir for children. Four volumes. Four volumes. And this book, it took me 10 years. I was doing several projects at the same time, alhamdulillah. So, those four volumes, each volume took me two years to finish with a big team of imams and editors. And we had children in the, in the team. Because this translation is for children, it has to be edited by them. So we had 70 children between the ages of 7 to 12. They read everything with me. Our chief editor is from here, from Edmonton, Brother Aaron Wanamaker. You probably heard of him. He's a fantastic brother, mashallah. Uh, he is the chief editor of the project. We use hundreds of stories to explain ayat and surahs in the Quran. Starting with Asbab al nuzul uh, stories from Rasulullah and the Sahaba, why these ayat were revealed, to give you the historical background. And stories from our modern times, like a story about a Muslim from, uh, from Somalia, a Muslim from Turkey, Japan, Egypt, Canada. So most, the, the children will see the diversity of Islam, and also words of wisdom and gems, what they need to learn. And also, in the book, I try to answer some of the most common and challenging questions that our children ask. They like to ask questions. So for example, they ask, if Allah created everything, who, create, who created Allah? The kids ask these questions. And there is nothing wrong because they want to understand and learn and, and grow in faith. Uh, in Surah Baqarah, Ibrahim السلام, asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, كَيْفَ تُحِيَ الْمَوْتَ? How do you give life to the dead? And the malaika asked Allah, what is the hikmah of putting the human race on earth even though they will cause a lot of trouble? They wanted to know the hikmah. There is nothing wrong with asking questions. They ask, if shaitan is so evil, why did Allah create him in the first place? They ask, if Allah exists, why there is so much evil in the world? Why are all the anbiya men, not women? 
Kids ask these questions. And the worst thing that you can do as a father is to tell them, shut up, don't ask these questions in my house, you're not my kid anymore. No, the answer is there in the Quran, in the Sunnah. If you don't know the answer, it doesn't mean the answer doesn't exist. So the answer is that we need to teach them. So when they grow older, they become confident in their faith. Alhamdulillah. So the translation is there. I've done my part over the last 10 years. When I stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Yawm al-Qiyamah, I will say, Ya Allah, this is what I have done for Islam. 10 years of my life, the prime of my youth. I translated this. I even, last year, I retired from, as an imam. I left the imam job for other imams to do. So no more counseling for me, no more talaq, no more khula. I'm focusing on the Quran 100%. So I've done my part. This is your time, inshallah, to do your part. Uh, these books are available for sponsorship. So we want to put copies like this in the hands of every non-Muslim in Canada, man or woman. In the last few years alone, alhamdulillah, we have distributed to non-Muslims more than 4 million copies in the US and Canada. So we cannot do it on our own, we need your support. A box of 52 copies, a box of 52 copies will cost you $156. $156. If you need a tax receipt, we'll give you one, inshallah. But the copies will go to non-Muslims, uh, da'wah organizations, massages to give them to non-Muslims. And every week, we send hundreds of these copies to prisons in Canada. Prisoners have nothing but time, so they request Qur'ans, and alhamdulillah, we have given thousands of shahadas in Canada. Thousands of shahadas. Because when you connect people with the Quran, Allah is talking to them, they are moved, they are touched, they accept Islam. So inshallah, we want you to be part of this project. Uh, you can sponsor inshallah these boxes now or at Taraweeh, inshallah, come prepared. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the barakah, the blessings of the month of Ramadan. May Allah accept from all of us. May Allah accept our fasting, our salah, and our zakah, and our sadaqah, and our ibadah in this month. And may Allah accept our good deeds and forgive our sins. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless Masjid al farooq and this community. It's a beautiful, lovely community, mashallah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the best in this life and the best in the life to come. Jazakallah khair for listening and being a good uh, audience. And we'll see you inshallah at uh, Maghrib and uh, Isha and Tarawih bi'idhin ta'ala. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum.